Okay, Romans chapter number five is a it's a fantastic chapter of the Bible. It contains there's a lot of great doctrine. You probably read, you know, notice as we're reading through them. And look at verse number one. It says, "Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace when we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God." So notice, we're justified by faith. We have access into this, this grace. It's, it's by faith, salvation by faith. That's contained in, in Romans chapter uh, number five. We also see, um, look down at verse number six. It says. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, as we always use this verse at Solomon, that, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so we see salvation, it's in Jesus' death, it's in his burial, it's in his resurrection. But the passage I want us to look at this morning actually starts in verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now I don't know if you noticed that I was kind of emphasising all the way through there, the word one, over and over talked about, but one it happened here, there was, there was one man, because it was basically what it's doing is it's contrasting. It's contrasting one man, Adam, with one man, Jesus Christ. Now today is December the 23rd, which means we're only two days out from Christmas, so the sermon this morning is actually going to be a Christmas sermon. Now, I, I usually preach a Christmas sermon on the Sunday before Christmas each year. Not that I necessarily think Jesus was born then, but uh, it's, it's a good idea to remember Jesus' birth. And so I mean, if you're going to do it, why not do it at the time when most other people do it? You know, in other words, you know, we're different enough. As independent Baptists, we're different enough as it is. There's no need to make ourselves unnecessarily different. And um, the fact is, no, no one really knows when Jesus was born, and I'm not preaching on that th- this morning. Um, you know, I- I've seen all the arguments people put forward, and they prove this and prove that, and really it just doesn't, doesn't stack up. No, nobody really knows when he was born. Okay? And, um, but of course, the Bible also says, we don't turn there, but in Romans chapter 14, it says that it's, it's not a commandment of God. You know, the Bible says, you know, one man esteemeth one day above another, and he says another, another, esteemeth every day alike, you know, and he says, let every man be fully persuaded his own mind. In other words, you can, if you want to have a special day, if you want to remember a Christmas day, that's great. If you don't, that's fine, you know. In other words, you've got that freedom. You can do whatever you want to do. But I do think that it is a good idea. I do think it's a good idea to remember Jesus' birth, okay? Um, we, you know, to take a time and remember Jesus' birth, remember the gift that God gave to the world through Jesus Christ. Um, you're there in Romans chapter number 5. Look at Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23. Another verse we often use out solving. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but, notice this, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, turn if we to Matthew chapter number Matthew chapter number 1. This is sort of a, a passage you more normally would, would be at uh, during a Christmas sermon. Look at Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 18. Matthew chapter number 1. In verse number 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. 
Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily, put her away secretly. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Turn over if you would to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2, and verse number 10. Luke chapter number 2, Luke chapter number 2, and verse number 10. Luke 2, 10, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Look back at chapter number 1. Chapter number 1 of Luke. It says in verse number 26, Luke chapter 1, and verse number 26. And it says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. We sang earlier on, you don't need to turn there, but remember we sang in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, For unto us a child is born. It's talking about Jesus. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, as we approach Christmas Day, it's a time when, you know, as we realise, even the unsaved world remembers the birth of Jesus. Because when Jesus came into the world, he literally divided history. You know, we're approaching the end of 2018 AD. That AD stands for Anno Domini, which is the, means the year of our Lord, and probably in Latin or something like that, I'd say. Now, if you go back more than 2,000 years ago, the numbers actually start counting backwards. You know, you go back, you know, maybe 10 BC, 100 BC, 1,000 BC. What's the BC? The BC is before Christ. Now, some people try to remove Jesus from the calendar, but the, they, they call it CE, Common Era, or they call it BCE, before common era. You might see dates with, B, with, with those, those letters. But of course, there's still a dividing line 2,000 years ago. W- what is that dividing line? <laughs> what happened 2,000 years ago? Well, that's when Jesus came to earth. Okay? Unto us a son is given. You know, that's what it says in Isaiah 9.6. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, Jesus, he was unique. Jesus, was who, he was unique. And there's, I mean, there's lots of scriptures we could look at. Look at, um, for example, Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 10. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 10. This is something unique about Jesus. Acts 14. It says, <clears throat> Acts chapter 4 verse 10 says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is unique. He's the only name by which people can be saved. Look at Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 9. Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 9. It says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Turn back if you were to Isaiah chapter number 45. Isaiah chapter number 45, because of course what we've just read in Philippians, that alludes to what it says back in Isaiah chapter number 45. Isaiah chapter number 45 and verse number 21. Isaiah chapter number 45. Isaiah 45 and verse number, verse number 21. It says, Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Saviour. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And that's exactly what it's talking about back there in in Philippians. You know, in Isaiah 45, look at Isaiah chapter number 43. Isaiah chapter number 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse number 10. Isaiah 43 and verse number 10. It says, Yeah, my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall, we, shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, yeah, my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was... I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, the, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cries in the, sh- in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. That's Jesus who's been talked about. He's the Lord. He's God. He is the King. Um, and when Jesus came to Nathanael in John chapter number 1, he said, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. When Jesus was crucified in John nineteen nineteen, it says, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Jesus, he was unique. He was, there was no one like him. Now, there's no doubt, when we think about Jesus, that Jesus is the one person who changed history more than any other. You know, if you, if, you go, if you go and look up lists of people who've changed the world, you, know, you can look up you know, people who've changed the world. The person that's going to be ahead of those lists yeah. is Jesus. But of course, I mean, in addition to Jesus, you can, you can, you know, he's not the only one on the list. There are, lists of, there are other people included in the list, otherwise it would just be him. Okay? There are other people who had a profoundly positive impact on the world. I mean, you might see someone like, you know, someone like William Wilberforce. You know, he was instrumental in the abolition of slavery in the Western world. You know, there's been books written about him and movies and stuff. It's really interesting looking at his life. You know, uh, Johann Gutenberg, he invented the printing press. I mean, that revolutionised the, the entire world. Um, Florence Nightingale, she improved hospital practices. She was basically the, the founder of nursing, as we know it. You know, you might think, okay, well, that's great, but how is that relevant to me? How is that relevant to me? Well, it's true that none of us is Jesus, okay? And, and to be honest, the chances of us having an impact on a global scale you know, might not be necessarily the highest. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not necessarily the highest. But the truth is that your life can make a difference. Your life can make a difference. Look, if you would, at um, Ezekiel chapter number 22. Ezekiel chapter number 22 and verse number 30. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God says, look, I sought for a man that should make up the hedge and stand the gap. He, he was seeking for someone to make a difference. But sadly, in this case, he didn't find one. He didn't find one, and so judgment came. But of course, the Bible is also full of examples of men and women who did stand up and who did make a difference. You're there in Ezekiel. Look back at Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 8. Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 8. It says also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. That's what Isaiah, he stood up and said, Yes, I'm here, send me. Jesus said to his disciples in John 20, 21, He said, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Guess what? People have been sent by God. Isaiah was sent by God. Jesus sent his disciples. 
And of course, if we're Jesus' disciples, that means that he has sent us. You might think back and think back of a, a, about a great man. Think about someone like Moses. Think about Moses. What sort of impact did Moses have on the Israelites when they were in bondage in Egypt? God used Moses to lead them to freedom. But of course, Moses himself, he actually said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Turn, if you would, to, uh, to Esther. Esther, chapter number four. Esther, chapter number four. Esther, chapter number four. In verse number, verse number 14. And of course, remember, this is when the, when the Jews were in, were in trouble and um, you know, there was uh, Haman um, was basically rising up against them. He was trying to get them all put to death. And... Um, and Esther had been taken in to be the, to be the, the queen in, in replacement for, for Vashti. And um, he didn't realise that she was a Jew. And of course there was, there was Mordecai, and, and that was who Haman was, was really out to get. But he said, I'm not just, just going to destroy Mordecai, I'm going to just kill all his people. I'm going to wipe out the Jews. You're there in uh, Esther chapter number 4. Look at verse number... Uh, we're over here... Oh, look, look, look at verse number 10. It says, And Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him the commandment, gave the commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king in these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself, that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He's saying, look, yeah, sure, it's a, it's a dangerous thing, but who knows if you're not called to the kingdom for such a time as this? And we know, you know, in the story, what Esther, she did go in, and she did end up, you know, saving the people. You know, she was able to. She was able to speak to the king, and obviously, God had a massive part to play in that, and and, and, and so forth. We're not getting into it now, but the point is that Esther was someone who made a big difference. Now, the thing is, we can read the Bible and we can think of all amazing people like an Esther, or, or think about maybe maybe an Elijah. Think about Elijah. You know, who God used in amazing ways. And you might say, well, but I'm not like that. God could never use me to do great things. Well, turn if you were to James chapter number five. James chapter number five. James chapter number five. Think about Elijah and his confrontation. Maybe confronted all the all the prophets of Baal and, and um, you know on Mount Carmel and, and, and the great things he did. Well, look what it says in, in James chapter number five. <clears throat> James chapter number five and verse number seventeen. It says Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruits. So when it says Elias, it's sort of the, the Greek version, Elijah. It's got the, the A-H is, is how it finishes in the Hebrew, but in the Greek it's, it's A-S. But it says, look, he was a man subject to like passions as we are. He's saying, Elijah, he was like you guys. He had the same passions. He had the same, he had the same issues that we have. He says, but look, he prayed earnestly. That it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. God answered his prayers. And the point, because this is coming afterwards, so saying this is what we should be doing. We should be praying. Okay? Um, the people that Jesus took, if you think about it, the people that took and Jesus took and used to preach the gospel, they were ordinary people. You know, you think about a fisherman. Is a fisherman, is that a prestigious career? You think of someone who's a fisherman, right? That's, that, that's like really prestigious. No. But that's what many of his early disciples were. Now, it's true that you might look at someone like the Apostle Paul and say, well, but hang on, he was different. He was, he was specially trained. He was specially trained by the rabbis. But what did Paul think about that? Look at Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 4. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 4. It's true that Paul, he did have a lot of advantages. He was, you know, he, was, he had a privileged position. But look at um, Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 4. He says, though I might also have confidence... In the flesh, if any man, if any other man thinketh that he had robbery, might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But look what he says here. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss 
For the excellency, excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So what did Paul think about all the advantage he has? He says, I, just, I count these things as dung. I can't, these, these things are just like you know, rubbish, just waste. That's what it is. Now, the reason why Paul achieved so much in service to God is not because of those advantages he had. The reason is because of how hard he worked. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse number 10. Paul speaking says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So notice, here's the thing about Paul. He worked really, really hard. Now he attributed, he says, look, I worked harder compared to the other apostles. He worked harder than everyone else. You know, he laboured more abundantly. But it was God's grace that was with him. Okay? But here's the thing. If you work hard, you can accomplish great things in God's service as well. Turn to Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew chapter number 20 and verse number 1. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 1. Matthew 20 verse 1 says... For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire labourers into his vineyard. Notice it's saying here, the kingdom of heaven, what's it like? A man who goes out to hire labourers. The kingdom of heaven, it's about, it's about working. And when he agreed with the labourers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So notice he's saying, look, he gets these people and he sends them out to work. And he finds more people and he sends them out to work. He finds more people. He says, Why are you out idle? They say, Well, no one's hired us. He says, Look, go out and I'll reward you. Go out and I'll reward you. And that's what God is like. You see, God promises to reward us. It says in uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse number 18, it says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the, the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. God will reward you if you labour. You're there in Matthew chapter 20. Look at Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 27. Matthew 16, verse 27, says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Notice that. He says he's going to reward every man according to his works. Look at Revelation chapter number 22. Revelation chapter number 22, right at the back of your Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 12. It says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So Jesus says, look, I'm coming back. I've got a reward. Guess what? I'm going to reward every man according as his work shall be. The reward you receive from Jesus is going to be, you know, determined by your work. Okay, this is obviously it's not talking about salvation. We know by grace you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. But then it also says, but we're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. God's got good works for us to do. He wants us to do them so that we'll be rewarded. You know, in Revelation 22, look at um, Colossians. Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3 in verse number 23. Colossians chapter 3 in verse number 23. It says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Now we started back in Romans chapter number 5. And in Romans chapter number 5, remember we saw there was one man, Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He brought salvation to the world. But do you remember there was another man that was talked about in that chapter? There was another man that was mentioned in that chapter. One man, Adam. What did Adam do? He brought sin and death into the world. You see, and there are, there are other famous examples. So Jesus, he's like the ultimate example of someone who brought good. Adam is the example of someone who brought bad. Well, there are other examples of people who, who had a tremendous impact on the world in a negative way. 
you know, I'm busy wading through, you know, the, the rise and fall of the Third Reich at the minute, and it's it's an interesting account of the, the madman Adolf Hitler, who, although he did have help from countless other people, he plunged the whole of Europe and, and other parts of the world into devastation and destruction at an unbelievable scale. One man had a huge impact, but in a bad way. Turn your foot to Joshua, chapter number 7. Joshua, chapter number 7. You might say, well, I'm not, um, I'm not going to be Adolf Hitler. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. That's good. But the thing is, we can still have a bad impact on the world around us in a, in a smaller way. Look at, look at um, Joshua, chapter number 7. Joshua, chapter number 7. Joshua, chapter number 7. Verse number 1. It says... But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. So this is just after they've, they've defeated Jericho. They had, they've had a great victory. But it says um, they committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So notice, one guy, Achan, has done something. But who's, who's, gonna, who's in trouble? It's more than just him. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. So this is the next place they're going to they're going to fight against after Jericho. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labour thither, for they are but few. Now this is interesting. So they, they come back and they say, Look, just let two or three thousand go up. Don't let everyone go up. He says, you know, make not all the people to labour. We don't want everyone working. Just a few people. We'll just send, up a, just send up a few people. How does it go? So they went up thither of the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them, and smote of them about 30 and 6 men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Sh- uh, Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So notice, they, they got defeated, they got chased, they lost the battle. And, and don't miss it, 36 men died. 36 men died. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we'd been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. And Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? See, he's distressed because they ran away. They were scared. And he says, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around. They're going to surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And what does God say to Joshua in answer to his prayer? Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? So Joshua's lying on his face, praying before God. God says, get up. Stand up. He says, Israel hath sinned. You see, some people think that the solution to everything is to pray. That's what some people think. The solution to everything is just, just pray. Just pray. Now, praying is a good thing. We're commanded to pray. You know, remember we've seen in Bible study, Samuel said you know, that he wouldn't you know, sin, by cease, sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for them. It's important that we pray. But he's, God says, well, look, get up. Get up off your face. Israel has sinned. That's what the problem is. They've also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they've even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So what have they done? They've been disobedient. They've broken God's laws. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So notice, there's sin in the camp. And so he says, what you've got to do is you've got to fix that problem. Because otherwise, I'm not going to be with you. He says, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So the reason why they're losing in their battle, the reason why they're being defeated, is because of the accursed thing. Because of the sin that's been committed and the stuff... you know, Achan's committed a sin, and he's got, and as we're going to see, there is stuff that is in the camp. In the morning, therefore, says verse 14, 
Therefore ye shall be brought according to your tribes. It shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah and took the family of the Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them. So he's saying, look, I desired them. I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So notice what happened. He saw these things. He saw these things, he desired them, and then he took them. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in the tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of his tent, and brought them unto Joshua, unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with them took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the gold, sorry, and the silver and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had burned them with stone, stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fest of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. So notice what happened to Achan. What, what happened to Achan? He, was, he was stoned to death. He was killed. But did you notice it wasn't just him that was killed? His, his family got killed as well. It says, and they stoned um, they stoned them with stones. So his whole family died. Now you say, well, that sounds, that sounds pretty harsh. That sounds pretty harsh. Well, one of the things you need to realise is that what you do will have an effect on the people around you. I mean, what Achan did affected 36 other men. 36 other men of Israel were killed. I mean, chances are those 36 men had wives. Chances are those 36 men had children. It affected them what he did. But not only not that, his own wife, his own children. Okay? Now, God didn't tell them to do that. In fact, it actually talks about that. It says in, um, uh, what's the verse? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 24, 16. says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither th- shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So according to God, should someone's kids be put to death because of what they've done? No, they shouldn't. Should someone's parents be put to death for what the child has? No. Even they should, be, they should die for their own sin. So what they did here, that's not according to God's will. That's not what God wants to happen. That's not what he commanded. But you can kind of understand why. Because, because of what Achan had done, and they were really mad, that's why people had died. And so you can kind of see that's how it happened. But the point is, is that our sin affects others, not just you. It doesn't just affect you, it affects others as well. The subtitle of the sermon this morning is The Impact of One. It's the Christmas sermon, but we're talking about the impact of one. One person can make a big difference. I mean, one man, Jesus Christ, he made the biggest difference in history. One man, Adam, had a big negative impact on the whole of mankind. His, his family was affected. Guess what? You're in Adam's family. You know, you might not necessarily have the impact you know, on the world on a global scale, although many people do have. But you will definitely have an impact on those around you, on your family, on your friends, on the other people in our church. What sort of impact, here's the question though, what sort of impact will it be? You see, because a church is made up of people. And the choices they make, whether they're good or whether they're bad, they will affect the whole church. Turn, if you would, to, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. We're looking at the effect or the impact 
of 1. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 12. It says, for as the body is one and hath many members. You know, there's many parts in the body. And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be one or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Notice that. A body. I mean, does the body just consist of one part? Or are there many parts? If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smell? Imagine, I mean, would you, would you rather just have, you know, would you rather have four eyes and no ears? Or would you rather have four ears and, and no eyes? No, obviously that would be a silly way to be, you know. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. So notice, you've got many parts, but it's just one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. I mean, what parts of your body are unnecessary? Any, any parts of your body you'd like us just just chop them off and you know throw them in the rubbish? Or are they, are they all necessary? And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism or no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. So when one part of the body is suffering, that affects the whole body. You know, think about your, your little toe. You know, that's a pretty small part of the body. But have you ever sto stubbed your little toe? You have. I've stubbed it and made it bleed. And it, it's only a little thing, but it affects, you know, it disables your whole body because it's not, you know, one part of it's not functioning properly. It says, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church. So this is what he's talking about. Just like you've got a body with many different parts, the church, an individual church, it's got different members within it. And God has set some of the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet shy into a more excellent way. So you've got different parts. You know, apostles and prophets. Now those are things that we don't have anymore. Okay? But we have access to them because their teachings are right here in the scriptures. Okay? Um, the gifts of tongues, we've talked about that. You know, people speaking in different languages. That's not something that, that God's doing these days where someone can speak a language they've never learnt. Okay? But today we've got access to learn every language. It's, you know, you just need to put a bit of work in to do it. But in those days, God actually miraculously enabled. You know, we read about it in the day of Pentecost and at other times. Okay? But notice, that's not for everybody. Do all speak with tongues? No. Okay? But the point is, you've got these different parts. You've got different members in a church. But everyone's got something to contribute. Everyone has something to contribute. Well, the question is, well, what are you contributing? You know? What, what, happens, what happens if you don't do your part? That hurts. The entire body. Turn if you to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 4. Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 4. It says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Guess what? We've got different functions. So we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, with a prophecy, let us prophesy according to proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on a ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. In honour preferring one another. Look at this verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Whatever our function is, we should be working hard, not being slothful. 
working hard, being fervent, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That's something we should all be faithful in. Distributing to the necessity of saints, give it a hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. Look down at verse number 21. It says, look, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We've all got different roles. We've got different roles. Are you fulfilling your role? You know, the sub- subtitle of the suit, Christmas sermon this year, it's the impact of one person. You know, I was reading a story to the girls yesterday. It was um, the, the Grinch who stole Christmas. And there's a part near the end where basically, you know, he's expecting all the, all the occupants of Whoville to be, you know, to be weeping and wailing, you know, because he, he stole all the presents, he stole all the food and all that sort of stuff. And, um, but instead, he listens for them weeping and wailing, but instead, they start singing. Why? They sing to celebrate. And he realises because Christmas is not about the food and the celebrations and the presents, it's about something more than that. And we know that Christmas is when we remember that Jesus came to earth to save us from our sins. He was born so that we might be born again. You know, we read in Romans chapter number 5, we read two examples of one man. One had a good impact, that's Jesus. One had a bad impact, that was Adam. The question is, what sort of impact are you going to have? That's the question. What sort of impact are you going to have? Are you going to have a good impact or are you going to have a bad impact? Because you are going to have an impact no matter what. Every one of us is going to have an impact. You can't just say, well, I'll just do nothing. Well, it's like, imagine, imagine part of your body and if part of your body wasn't functioning properly. You know, if you've got a, you've got a leg and it just it does nothing. What's it going to do? Isn't it going to be hard to get around with a leg that you're going to drag it around? Okay? It's going to have that. Make no mistake, what you do impacts not just your life, but it impacts the life of your family, it impacts the life of your friends, it impacts the life of your church. Are you going to have a good good impact or a bad one? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, I just pray you'd help each one of us to decide that although we're only one person, that we will have an impact for good. That we will go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That we will study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That we will continue and continue instant in prayer. That we would, you know, do the things that please you, Lord. That we would have love one toward another. That we would be forgiven. That we would walk in a way that pleases you. That we would let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Help us, Lord, to have a positive impact in whatever circles of life we're in. Help us to remember at this time, at this Christmas time, the impact that you had on the world. You divided history. Obviously, we're not going to have as big an impact as that. But help us make a difference, Lord. Help us make a difference. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.